My name is Peter Belles. I'm working in the data warehousing area since the year 2000. I started more in finance with classical Inman modeling. I switched over then to telecommunications, did more Kimball style modeling. And back in 2012, I came across data vault modeling because we had some challenges in certain projects like agility, like near real time warehousing. And that's where I started to use data vault, really liked it. And since then, I'm working for a company that is producing a data vault automation tool, but always I'm interested in the principles behind how data works, what we can improve, how to understand data, how to interpret it. And this is a little bit about a blog series that I wrote that I will introduce here in a short presentation. If you want to see all the details, you should be able, oops, as you see now probably a black screen. I can fix that in a second. Now, good. It's on my blog, a data vault blog covering different topics, and I have written four different parts about how you can interpret and use times in the data vault. And I will go through and I will uh, explain how I see the basic problem and solutions to different topics in there. It's not like a, a the academic work that I go through theoretical stuff. This is more like a hands-on approach, how I treat this kind of challenges in real-time projects. I try to give you as well a little bit examples, and I try to keep it very, very simple in the idea of giving you a tool set that you can use to sort out your, your challenges that you have in your current project. Your project will always be a little bit different, probably more complicated than what I present here, but that you get a little bit of vocabulary, that you get a little bit of of touch and feel with this kind of topics. If you want to contact me, you'll find me on LinkedIn. My name is spelled without a second E, so feel free to contact me. If there are any questions, please feel free to write it down on the chat. I hope I have any chance to see the Teams chat here. Otherwise, in the worst case, Christian needs to help me because I don't see it here. Yeah, sure. Good. So what is the main problem if you are treating different timelines and whatever, how we can overcome generally the complexity of times in the data vault? And here my general idea is that I will apply again and again when we go through the different slides is that if I have a timeline, I can cut it at any position and get the slice out of this timeline and then I have a point in time. And my basic consideration is always if I get a timeline, is it really relevant? It sounds like a, a stupid question, but I have seen again and again requirements to create some very complicated reports with many different timelines in it. And when we asked why are we doing this, we didn't got any answers. So always is my question is can we simplify it? Do we really need these timelines? Do they have any value? Are they adding something to the information we are generating? Otherwise, try to reduce it. Because as soon as we have different version of timelines, and if I have here the business validity and we get at different points in time, different information about what the information was already, I don't have only a, only a timeline, I get a mess but we can represent this as an area in time with two dimensions. As soon as I get to the point that I have two dimensions, again, I can apply the same principle and say, okay, if I have two different timelines, can I cut through one of the timelines and get from the area again to a line? And if I'm on a line, can I maybe get back to a point? In many cases, this might be already the solution. Let's assume it's not the solution for all these cases. So now is the question, if we get more complexity, how we deal with it? Just that you get some basic ideas, what means to ca cut time at certain points. There are some special timeline, uh, special points on the timeline. One is the as of, maybe when an event happened. So we get maybe the master data exactly at the time when the event happened. Another cut could be as is. 
So what is the latest status? So if I try to prepare a mailing, I will have this example a little bit later in more detail. Do I care about the past addresses of a customer? Or can I simplify that? Most probably yes. So this is really this considerations, sorting out the requirements and then and only then going forward. Good. So which kind of relevant timelines do I come across regularly? And I'm not talking now about insurance business where we have sometimes six or seven different timelines, which can include when a letter arrived in the mailing office, when it was scanned, when it was processed and, and all this stuff as well to find press process. I try really to limit this kind of section on the three most relevant timelines that I get in most of the projects I'm working in. So let's start and have a look in the source system. This regarding the data warehousing system at all. So one thing that we get again and again is the business validity. For me, business validity is the validity in the real world. So if I'm having a contract, there is maybe contract start date, there's a contract end date, there are maybe different versions of a contract. So how long is the contract really valid? And there's a second timeline, and I, I would call it inscription time. I come back that there are different terms for it. When was in my source system this information about the validity saved? And these two timelines are already a little bit different because business validity is information about the real world that can change on the inscription time axis. So maybe some customer sends us a letter he wants to finish his contract so we receive it maybe end of the year but end of the year there's a lot of mail to process so only in mid of january we realize he finished his uh, he, he terminated his contract end of the year it's valid he sent it in at the right time in point in time but we captured it much later and then we have two different versions of business validity here on this axis because until mid of January, we had one point of view about the business validity and from there on another one. So this is very critical in the source system. And if you have temporal things in your source system, you should always get a clean kind of inscription time, transaction time, whatever it is called in your source system. Now, if we load this into a data warehouse, and this is regarding if it's data vault style or any other style creating a history, we get here a load time. And here already the first confusion starts. So again and again in projects, I have seen that this load time was referenced by so-called valid time. And this creates a big confusion between, between the business validity time axis and the load time time access, which is only a technical time, when did the data arrive in the data warehouse, when we got knowledge about this business validity combined with inscription time. And the funny thing is that I was in many, co uh, many companies and all of them are using different names for this three time access. I come to this because Christian has written a really nice article about that and has tried to categorize the different namings from different authors, how they are named. So I came across one client and they teach me and say, hey, we had so many differences in namings that we just agreed on one thing. Let's call this the first dimension of time, this year the second, and this year the third. And whoever wants to name it, whatever he wants, just let's agree on this three time axis because that's like the order for us, how they appear. First, the business validity is there, an event in the real world is happening, otherwise we wouldn't capture it, even if it might be in the future. Second thing is it's inscribed into the source system. And the third time axis is when we loaded it into our reporting system. And interesting thing is using this, this naming, I came really far talking to people and making them understand what we're talking about at all. So a little bit about the different times. There may be Christian Kennedy and explain a little bit better than me how he came to all this information. I would just reference here his article 
which I very liked and which was as well for me the start for understanding which kind of time access do we have and how people call it and try to reduce it to, to a reduced set of names. So let's look at the selected timelines in detail. First one is again business validity. And business validity is really, really special because first thing is it can ch be changed after we got information about it because we received maybe information about the real world events later than they happened, or we might receive information into the future. Here, if I have a move from the city of Zurich to the city of Basel, if I'm changing my address, I can inform somebody about this change already before it happened. So the first thing is it doesn't end in the moment right now, which for the inscription time and the load time is not true. Second thing is there might be points in time on this timeline where there is no information. I could give you the information that I'm moving away from Zurich. I don't know where I will be moving to. Here I don't inform you about where I'm living because I may be in a hotel or something looking for a new apartment and from here on I send you the new address that I'm living in Basel. So if we are trying to understand this kind of information, we need to see how the different slices on this timeline relate to each other. Are they overlapping? Sometimes we get wrong information about them. So it could be that I'm living still in Zurich, even I'm already living in Basel, still like this. There are really good articles about this kind of information from Dirk Lerner, how to apply Allen logic and interpret to the interpretation of this kind of information. Important is that even we have two different information on this timeline, both are valid. It's not because I'm now living in Basel that it's not true anymore that I lived back in Zurich, but they're not current. So I can live only on one place in this kind of, uh, of situation, but the new information doesn't replace the old one. That's different with the inscription time, that's different with the load time. This means that for one business key, so if there is a, there would be a business key for me as a person and my address, for the same key, we get two different information and both are valid. And now there are two ways to store that in the data vault. One could be that we say, this is a different grain. It's not my address, but it's my address history. And if I see this as an address history, then the business key plus the begin date here, and I would call this here the valid from date. I know I'm, it's difficult to use this term because some people use it for the load time, but I would call this really the valid date here. Would be the key for once this time slice and the same business key with the other valid from date would be the identifier for this time slice here on this timeline. And people ask sometimes, why don't we use the end time? Because the end time changes more often, but it could be as well a good identifier if it wouldn't change that often. And we have sometimes open intervals at the end, which makes it impossible usually to use the end time as identifier. It wouldn't be the best. The problem is if we follow this approach, we have one issue. Imagine that this time slice moves a little bit, means Maybe I got the information I couldn't move in on January, I could move only in on February. From the source system, now we see a new time slice starting in February and one that disappeared from January. And only from the data, we don't need know if it's a new time slice or if this one moved. So we need to write a business rule interpretation. What is the most probable case that we got a new key for this kind of information? Is there another way to store that? Yes, 
as we have multiple valid entries for the same business key, we could use as well the multi-active satellite pattern. That's now my personal decision that I don't like it too much for, for different reasons about delta loading and stuff like that. But from a logical modeling perspective, that's perfectly valid to create this kind of multi-active satellite. Some people call it then especially in this case, like a bitemporal satellite. And it's cool because if you do that and you say it's a special kind of multi active satellite, you can build in a little bit of more rules into your automation and then automatically define that this kind of start times are sub partition key for your multi active satellite. So this is about business validity. That's the first step. Second step is the inscription time. So when did we got knowledge about this business validity? And in the meantime, I found a very simple solution for that one. Usually, if the load time on this time axis is near to the inscription time in regards to your business that you're doing, you could ignore the 2D time axis and store just the 2D time as an attribute into your satellite. If you do that and you want to know when exactly the information was changed in your source system, because you maybe want to look at, at fraud patterns where some people are really doing quick changes in the system to trick some reports into provision payments or stuff, stuff like that, you have all the information because you created as well the history of this attribute in your satellite. You just need to, instead of taking the load time in your data vault, attribute to reorder your data if necessary. Now, the problem is we get more and more source systems like Kafka streams. And in a Kafka stream, it is not guaranteed by design that the messages, if changes happened here in the source system, arrives in the same order into your data warehouse. So it can be relevant that you use this kind of information to reorder the changes in the order as they happened in your source system. Otherwise, you would get the wrong path of changes in your reports, if this is relevant for you. Especially if you want to do like process mining, you want to know exactly how long stuff was in a certain process step, then it could be relevant that still you regard it and that you take this as important timeline in your target data vault. But for many people, most probably you could limit it just to an attribute and look at it at the read time. And as well, in this case, you could still apply the same, but you would need to then, when you create your reports, really look at this timeline. And the automatic SCD detection, the changes wouldn't be perfectly correct. So it could be that you maybe want to already, while importing the data, rely on this load time. Second thing is the load time itself. Let's assume that we just removed here the, the 2D time axis and we decided that we take it as an attribute. We can look at this timeline and this timeline is managed by your data warehouse. So we can trust it, at least as, as, as long as we trust ourselves. And the second thing is it ends at a certain point. So there is always as of now view, which ends currently right now. But there are two interpretations of what the load time should be. One is when did the data arrive in the staging area or when was the data loaded into the raw vault? Why would I do that? So the first thing is really to see, okay, this time stamp is nearer to the 2D timestamp that we had here. I know exactly when I started the load. So what was the point in time where we captured the data from the source system? Why would I do the second thing? The second thing is, if I use the load time into the raw vault, I know exactly when, if I have 
virtual access layers, meaning views just accessing the raw vault and creating all the dimension and everything, when was the data available to report? And this can be for certain companies a very, very important information, especially if you take like investment decisions based on the data in your data warehouse, it could be relevant that you can reproduce exactly the view as the analyst had it at the second he took investment decision. And then the time difference between the data that was staged and loaded into the core can be relevant. If you do fraud detection and you turn off somebody's phone account because you saw at this moment in time a fraud pattern, it's relevant maybe to the second to really prove why you did that. But for many, many people, the difference between these two times is probably very minor and not relevant. And as I say, I understand both perspectives. So just be aware of that this could be a difference, even if people are doing data vault, that they use different load timestamps and have a different, a little bit different point of view on what this timeline represents. So now that we have our basic time axis, many people don't ask themselves, what is the meaning of change? What does a changed attribute mean at all? They just heard, and I really get this a lot, the way I'm now explaining it here, is that people come along and say, we want to do a SCD type two dimensions on everything. And we ask them back here, yeah, but what does the change implicate? And they don't understand this question. So what kind of changes do we have? A change can represent a real change or a correction. And that's really relevant to understand what it means when you report on it. So let's assume that I'm ordering in an online shop and I first order with P dot, then somebody finds out that I'm called Peter and then somebody realizes, no, that my name is spelled like this. This kind of changes are corrections. Is there any value of knowing the history of these corrections? It depends. For most of the reports, it isn't. If I would export all these three different names and I try to report on different names that did orders, it would make no sense because I would appear as three different customers. It makes no sense. If I try to write a letter, it doesn't matter. It was a correction. So the last value we have in the source system and loaded on the load time time access on 3D into the data warehouse is the most relevant. So we should output only the as of now point of view on this time axis. On the other hand, if this would be my last name and I get married and I would change in the marriage my last name, it is relevant because then really it's a change in the name that we maybe need to track. Maybe we have contracts with the old name, maybe contracts with the new name. And for a from a legal perspective, we need to report on this and track the name changes of a person. And the ugly thing is, both things can happen in the same name, uh, in the same column. So especially for the last name, there can be corrections and there can be as well real changes that we capture. So really it's based on the report or data usage type that I have in mind that I need to sometimes export really the history of this attribute or sometimes just the as of now cut at the end. That's what I told you. Good. So what does it mean? So if we figure out that, yes, the changes are real, that we have a business requirement for that, and we want to output that. And we need to do it in SCD type 2. So what is the right time access? Is it the load time? Is it the validity? What would be the right view on your data? And it depends. It's really the important point is that if we follow the rules that we capture everything, that we capture the different dimensions, that we like the business validity capture in the keys or as multi-active satellites, if we capture the inscription time as attribute in the satellite and we have the load time as well 
when we are loading the satellites, we can decide at query time. But how do we know what we should query? Depends. What is the purpose of my report? So I'm repeating myself, I know it, but I think it's a question not asked enough times. So if I want to send letters out, it's pretty clear. I'm just interested in the latest address. If I want to know to which cities I shipped my orders, it might be relevant that I know exactly where the customer was living at that point in time. So what to do? Simple. Ask your data consumers about their business requirements. Really try to understand if something is relevant for them or not. If they can't tell you if the history is relevant for them, assume it is not. Give them the as of now cut or whatever time of cut as of then cut at the time of transaction. Just reduce the complexity because the more timelines we expose to the reporting world, the more complex the reports get, the more error prone they become. So for me, it's always, if you can't tell me why you need the history, I assume you don't need it. If I give you the data and you show me that something is missing, I'm happy to provide it even later. We recorded it, but I don't export it to the recipient yet. So let's go back now a little bit to my personal recommendations. And I'm absolutely happy if somebody has different point of view here. It's really based on my experience, what I usually do. As a repetition, remove unnecessary timelines. Check this again and again. Even if you created already something, can you take out any of these three dimensions out of your reports? Second thing is, I'm creating in the meantime business validity as an instance or version hub. So I'm really taking a hub and I'm combining the business key with the valid from date and create it as own object. Why do I do that? Because I figured out, and I give you now an example which is quite common in the insurance industry, that you have contracts or policies and they are changing over time. The coverage is changing, so you may be signed that you want to increase your coverage from 1 million to 2 million and stuff like that. Now, against these different instances of the same contract, which has different business validities, you get claims reported and the claims can be reported much later. So you figure out that your boat sank last December. Even you was not there, you were home and only in February you realized that your boat sank into the ocean. So you report it in February, but the relevant instance of the contract that you had is the one that was valid until end of the year that had a certain coverage. If you create a special hub for the instance, for the temporal aspect of your contract, you can link the claim directly to the instance. If you would create it with multi-temporal satellites, you couldn't link a claim directly to a specific version. Do you need that always? Maybe not, but you can't do that because direct links to satellites are just not allowed. It would create a big mess. But still, the alternative pattern is to create multi-active satellites, and it might be even necessary to do that. This is if you need at query time to decide which kind of information you want to output. And this is an example that I didn't have myself, but a colleague of mine explained me that in his project, they needed to decide when they created the report, which kind of time slices they were exporting from the different objects. So they needed to load all the versions into the multi-active satellite and then at query time do the right cuts from the different objects. So the relations were not going to a specific instance of a contract in my example, but they were really going just to the contract and at report time you would decide what you need to output. So there might be reasons to choose one of the two solutions 
For me, I'm choosing generally this kind of solution and it works. We could so far model everything that we needed with it. But if you have a reason for another uh, solution, do that. Second thing is to reduce timelines, how I do that sometimes. It's I'm taking attributes that are maybe related to a dimension and putting it at the transaction level. So example that I have here that's from a real world example is I had a company that was producing certain tools and sometimes they produce the tools themselves and sometimes they just bought them from some open market and resold them under their own brand. And they needed to know for which orders they delivered their own products that they produced themselves and for which ones they were just reselling the same kind of product. It was a very standardized tool. So what you can do is now you could output the sales order line into your report. You could create a history of your product, STD type 2, and in your report link then the sales order line to the right line in the STD type 2 kind of product. But as the time when the order was shipped, and that was the relevant time, was defined, we were able to create a business rule and just take the attribute as it was back there in time and put it into a business world satellite down here. And from there on, we were sure that this order was delivered with this kind of product. And this simplified reporting a lot because now the attribute was just on the fact. We didn't need it to create at all a STD type 2 output of the product because the product name and stuff like that that was more like a correction attribute where we anyway wanted to have the latest version of it in the report. And here, the different types of products that were delivered were captured directly at this grain. By the way, we figured out that this pattern can solve certain GDPR issues. Why that? Imagine that this is not the product, but this is a customer. So. It's a little bit out of line command, but just that you maybe, I thought that it's the right cool. So imagine that you have a customer and this customer lives in a city where you ship the order and stuff like that. And you want to report into the future in which regions you are shipping and different other attributes that are important for you, but you're not allowed to keep the customer forever because there is a deletion period defined after which you need to delete the customer data if he doesn't reorder. And one of the options could be as well to use the same process to write certain attributes that can't identify the customer if linked just to the order back here to the sales order line and store it there. So, so it's this approach of simplification. You can use it for time, but you could maybe, and just as, a, as an idea, and I'm happy to discuss this if somebody has other ideas about this, to solve GDPR issues and then still delete then the customer if necessary, but the important reporting related attributes not connected anymore to the person can be continued to be used in the future. Good. What I see again and again is that people tell me, yes, 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 that's the load time, that's a technical timeline in the data warehouse, but for us, it's the business validity. And that one is difficult. It's, it's a little bit tricky. Because, no, it isn't. For sure, there is a disconnect between the validity and the load time if you don't do really near real time loading. But is it relevant? Probably not if you have slowly changing attributes. Can it be the best approximation for the business validity if your source system doesn't capture it? Uh, yes. So, it can be a valid approach to solve an issue if you're aware of that this is just a proxy and it's not the real thing. So it could be the best approximation for business validity for certain product attributes, stuff like that. But still, if it's really relevant for you to capture the business validity and if there should be as well the option to change certain attributes in retrospective or to capture it in the future, you should change your source system. But again, Maybe that's not in your control. So it could be a valid approach. I'm just a little bit cautious if people tell me to do that everywhere. 
to just say, okay, yes, that, that's our only approach. We don't care about business validity in the source system. Most often, there you should watch a little bit if their processes are broken, if it really is everything working out as requested. But as I say, it could be a valid approach as long as we document what we are doing and that this is not the real thing. It's just a stand-in as long as we don't get any business validity for the from the source. And I think as well, this is the source of this mix-up of valid from coming from being used here for the load time, because some people said, yeah, that's the best proxy we have. So they just called it valid from valid to, and people continued using it for all the load times. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's my personal interpretation. So I need to progress a little bit faster. That we really need to do a SCD type 2 output. How do we do that? And the data vault literature tells you to create a so called point in time table. So to create like a temporal index joining together your hub and your satellite timelines. The question is what happens with links? So in my picture here, that's my hub. That's a relation or link table to another hub. And we have the satellites here around it. And a usual pit table would join the hub and here satellites. And we have figured out that if we include as well one to one links into our pit table for one hub and many to one links because they are always driven by this hub, we can already create as well a pit table, which can be then used later to join different elements together to create really SD type two dimensions. And just to differentiate that we're adding this kind of links into our pit table, we just call it pit plus. As well, what we do already while creating the pit table, because we're anyway creating a temporal index, is that we're already calculating the end times. I've seen this as well from other authors. It's nothing, something that we have invented, but that's just the basic idea that if we want to output the data based on the load time into the report, a pit table can help to speed up the query time. They could be virtual even. I've seen that as well. It depends on your database system that you, instead of creating a table, could create a view. The view is the advantage that it would only really calculate the kind of relations that you really need in your output. But in many cases that I have seen that it was created as a table. And the main driver is really the business requirement is yes, you validated you need the SCD type 2 output, then you create this kind of pit table. But pits are not a target in themselves. And I want to Really put, uh, really put the focus a little bit on it because uh, we often get the requirement say, can you create pit tables with your tool? And we say, yes, but what is your business requirement behind it? And say, we just want to know if you can create pit tables. And pit tables in itself are a technical artifact just to speed up some queries. They don't help you to create any queries at all. You could do them completely without pit tables or with virtual pit tables like per pit views. So, don't forget, pit tables are technical artifact, and only if you join the attributes which are relevant to your pit table, you get STD type 2 output. And one pit table is usually not enough. Usually you have different grains that you denormalize to create a dimension value. And only if you're able to do that and automate that, then you're successful in creating dimensions. And that should be the business requirement in my point of view that the business user wants to see. And how can you do that? It's pretty simple. If you create, if you have here different hubs here called A, B, C, D, you can just create a pit table for A, D, B, and C, and then do a join either first between A and D, and then A and this combined to B. It's completely transitive, so you can Choose whichever join order you want or join everything together at once if your database system supports that and you don't lose the track. But you can really go step by step. So create first your pit tables, join them together, join all attributes, and you're good to go. But 
this should be your final output SCD type two dimension at the end. By the way, if you have time, have a look at alternative pit designs. I've read some very interesting articles with, uh, from Patrick Cuba. You find him on LinkedIn. He has a lot of uh, articles there as well, working with Snowflake. I really learned a lot of what he wrote, not agreeing with everything, but that, that's more on technical details. But really, what if I understood him well, what he's proposing is that he's adding into satellite tables a sequence column. And because a satellite table is only loaded by one source, it's not an issue. The sequence can be even managed by the database created very simply in the satellite table. That's not the same as creating sequences in the hub, which are loaded from different sources and maybe in parallel and stuff like that. And in the PIT table, you can use this sequence to link from your PIT table to your satellite. And this simplifies your join that you use only one column. And this can be on many database systems and I tested it, uh, I think on Snowflake, SQL Server and Exasol is usually a better way to join your pit table to your satellite. The explanation in detail would be a little bit long. And there's one disagreement that I have with him is, is a left join always better than an inner join? But that would be for another time and there are different arguments why left joints in certain situations may perform better, but not always. But as this is a different topic, it's just I just mentioned it because I'm calling, uh, mentioning here his concept and he's as well a strong advocate of equi joints, which has valid points, but it can be that at certain points, left joints might be a little bit better joining your pit table to your attributes. The advantage is that if there is not a full match between your pit table and the satellites means that you have sparsely populated tables, left joins might in certain situations, depending on your database system, perform better than in the joins, but not always.